Hello everyone, my name is Renee Garbone and I am the interim president for Social Science Club and the director of events for student government at North Campus and I want to move to our event. As many of us know, Florida's Amendment 4 and the effects of its implementation could be crucial to the meaningful future of our state as well as its many previously incarcerated and returning citizens. For that reason, it is important for us to better understand all the intricacies around reinstating the right to vote. <laughs> That's why our Social Science Club is co-sponsoring this event, and we are very pleased to see this great turnout of students and faculty alike. We urge you to keep us in mind because we will continue to host and sponsor these engagements. On behalf of North Campus State Government and Social Science Club, we are honored to be able to host this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Balzora, for finding the time to join us today, and thank you, Professor Kay, for providing us with the opportunity to meet and talk with Desmond Mee and Wayne Rowles. We are truly honored with their visit to our college. Thank you. Perhaps the champion of that, con uh, of that concept of political participation nowadays is Desmond Mee. An amazing person in many ways, right? Um, I think he should be nominated for Nobel Peace Prize, and in fact, he'll probably do that, right? He's certainly a significant person, declared as a top 100 most influential people in the world by the Times Magazine, because of the efforts he did to uh, provide inclusion for previously disenfranchised citizens of Florida. It's a heroic effort, and uh, instead of me talking about it, I reached out to Wayne, and Wayne is another amazing, I'm not, uh, how you say, as well known as Desmond, but amazing person, amazing worker here in South Florida. And uh, I invited them to come and share with us why is this issue important and why should you care, right? So the politics of political science that we learn in class and all the issues about national government that we learn in class are not abstract criteria, something that does not relate to us to our neighbors, to our loved ones, but it is indeed, um, how you say, the real uh, thing that affects our lives in so many different ways. And any democracy, what we learn in class, which is focused on inclusion, is a healthy democracy. A democracy. democracy that is focused on exclusion is perhaps not a healthy democracy. Nowadays, the, the discussion in our country when it comes to politics is all on exclusion, not inclusion. We want to exclude immigrants, uh, you know, illegals, this, that, and that went so far that about 150 years ago we designed the laws to include even the native foreign citizens of the state of Florida. So, without further delay, I was planning to acknowledge, I will be good if microphones work, I was planning to acknowledge some of the distinguished guests like we have, first of all, our uh, North Campus President. We have uh, our North Campus Academic Dean, Dr. Rolf, and certainly our uh, the, the Pathway Dean, Dr. Bozora, to uh, thank them for attending the event. Uh, my Associate Dean, Dr. Bernhardt, although he worked hard to help me organize it, he could not be here today. Um, but thank you all for coming. So let's have a, a microphone to Desmond Mead, who led the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition to a historic victory in 2008 with a successful passage of Amendment 4, a grassroots citizens initiative which restored voting rights to over 1.4 million Floridians with past felony convictions. Amendment 4 represented the largest, single largest expansion of voting rights in the United States in the half a century and brought an end to 150 years of a Jim Crow era law in Florida. Desmond is presently leading efforts to empower and civically, uh, civically re-engage local communities across the states and to reshape local, state, and national criminal justice policies. Without further delay, can we have you, Desmond? staff and students. It is definitely a pleasure being here. So, Amendment 4. Man, that was a that was a huge win. How many of you all are registered voters? Just raise your hand. How many of you all are thinking about registered vote? Raise your hand. 
You got to raise it high. Be proud of that. There you go. Well, those who are registered voters, how many voted for Amendment 4? Wow. So first of all, let me thank you for your support of Amendment 4. Um, you know, I, I tell people that, that, you know, in November last year when we found out that we had enough votes to actually win, you know, we had a huge celebration in Orlando, Florida. And, you know, I was looking at the people who were jumping around. We all had tears in our eyes, you know, there were so many folks that was happy. One particular was a guy named Mr. Charles. Um, Mr. Charles was a very elderly young man. <laughs> I said elderly <laughs> young man, right? He was young in spirit. But an elderly man uh, who lived in Tampa. And in 2016, uh, I remember I was engaging in some GOTV efforts. And I you know, was going in the community around the voting location. And I, was, I had a list of people who were registered voters, but who haven't voted yet. And so we were knocking on doors and telling people, hey, listen, you can go vote. You know, the vote location is two blocks away. They have a uh, fish fry and, and music and everything. It's a celebration. Why don't you come out and vote, you know, while you have an opportunity. And Mr. Charles was one of the people on the list. And I remember when I knocked on his door and he, he answered and he told me that he couldn't vote. And, he, and the reason why he couldn't vote, he said he had a letter that told him he couldn't vote. And so when he showed me the letter, what the letter read was that it was congratulating him on registering, well, on being registered to vote. And so I told him that he could, would he mind going to the polls? And he had no problem, but he had some medical conditions the way he couldn't walk. And so I convinced him to drive. And I remember walking next to the car, leading him to the polls. We got there, and because of his medical condition, we were able to get him to the front of the line, but he still had to wait a little bit. About an hour and a half later, he comes out of there um, with his head down, basically saying that they wouldn't allow him to vote. And, you know, it was like, well, why? He said, because I have a felony conviction. And when I, I went, to, I had my laptop there, and so I looked him up, and come to find out that eight years prior, he had been convicted of driving with a suspended license. And I remember when I seen that, you know, I, I started crying. And, and the reason why I did was that, you know, ironically, the voting location, which was a library, was right across the street from a graveyard. And I remember telling folks that, you know, that it was symbolic because either we vote or we die, especially for people of color, especially African Americans. That when we see the things that's happening in our communities where people, every day we have African American men and women that are being incarcerated, every day we have African American men and women that are being gunned down, sometimes by other African American men and women, or sometimes by law enforcement, right? And when we see this thing, and then we look at the turnout rates of African American, there was a correlation, and say that we need to vote so we can get the right people in office that can change the policies that will help save lives. And so, hence that phrase, we vote or we die, right? And so knowing that this graveyard was across the street and that this elderly man was turned away from the polls, the only thing that came to my mind was that he was going to die before he get to vote again. And that bothered me because he looked, he reminded me of my own father. You know, and um, I couldn't do it. I quit. I mean, I stopped doing everything. After him, I, did, I, I didn't have the spiritual power to continue doing anything on that day. And, but I, what I do know is that that experience strengthened my resolve to continue in the fight for Amendment 4. And he was there that night. He was there when we won. He was jumping up and down. And I remember when we hugged each other and we were both crying, the only thing he kept saying to me was, I can vote now. I can vote now. And that was an amazing moment. That was an amazing moment. And, and it was in that, it was during that embrace that I realized that there was something stronger than him being able to vote that night that was going on. 
that's when I started to realize that the big victory was not in franchising 1.4 million Floridians. It was huge, but it wasn't the, big, the biggest victory. The biggest victory that night, right, was that love won the day. You know, I started thinking about our campaign and how, you know, <clears throat> when we talk about felon voting rights, when you talk about the state of Florida, those are things that just don't mix together. It really don't. Florida is a very uh, divided state. Some people say it's three states in one, right? And, 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 and then when you talk about felons who, when you, when you hear the word felon, you think about, you know, the scourge of the earth. And to be able to talk about giving them the right to vote, that was a taboo subject. I was told that you know, every day I was involved in the campaign. But you had these ingredients that should not have been put together, but yet they were brought together that night. And then when you think about the, the political climate that we were in where there was so much hate and so much fear, right, that, that's being spread out in our, in, in our society, in our communities, right, to see that something as divisive and politically toxic as restoring the right to vote to formerly convicted felons was able to actually win, right, what it showed, right, especially when you looked at the campaign and how we, how we ran the campaign, was that none of those votes, we had 5.1 million people that voted for Amendment 4. And the significance of that number is that that represented over a million more people voting for us than voted for any candidate that was on the ballot. That represented a million people who voted for Amendment 4 that also voted for our, co our current governor, Ron DeSantis, which showed such a, bri a broad cross-section of support for Amendment 4. And when we looked at this campaign and we looked at everything surrounding it, what we seen was, wait, wait a minute, those 5.1 million votes weren't votes that was based on hate. They weren't votes that was based on fear. They were votes that was based on love, forgiveness and redemption. And love won that day. And that is the, to me, the greatest thing because in these days and times, what we need a lot more of is love. Not division, not hate, not, not, not criminalizing human beings, not making a, 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 an attempt to have a better life illegal, not judging people because of their sexual identity, but loving people because of the humanity that is in each and every one of them. And that was what our campaign represented. Connecting with each other, each and every one of us, along the lines of humanity. And to me, that was a great thing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Desmond Mead. I am the Executive Director of Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Let me tell you how I got here. August of 2005. In South Florida, I stood in front of railroad tracks on a hot and humid August day. And for a few moments, I was actually able to, to block out that heat and humidity because at the time I was standing there, I was a broken man. I was homeless. I was addicted to drugs. I was unemployed recently released from prison. And I didn't have any self-esteem. I didn't have any hope. I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And so as I stood there, the only thing that was going through my mind was how much pain I was going to feel when I jumped in front of an oncoming train. And I knew that my parents didn't raise me to be in that position. But there I was that day, and I stood there, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And I started thinking about 
how much pain I was going to feel and whether when that train hit me was I going to die instantly or was I going to experience some moments of excruciating pain as, as those iron wheels just crushed or severed my body. And I didn't, I didn't like pain, but even the thought of the pain that I was going to have to endure was not enough to make me move. And so I stood there and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. I didn't want to go on. I saw no use as a drug, matter of fact, as a crackhead. I felt they let down his family and friends, killed all my dreams. I was no use to anyone. So I might as well. And so I waited. I kept waiting, but for some reason that train would not come that day. And I ended up walking across the tracks. And it just so happened that two blocks further was a place where, called Central Intake Facility. And I was able to go there and I, I checked myself in the drug treatment. And I spent four months and drug treatment and after successfully completing it, I moved into a homeless shelter, downtown Miami. And while I was there, I was like, man, I, I you know, I, I wanted to do something to stop using drugs. See, this was not my first go around. You know, I, I, I've been abusing drugs for many years prior and, and I would stop and my life would improve and things would get better and Life would be good and something would happen and I would use drugs again and I ended up right back where I started and sometimes even lower. And it kept going on and on and on and, and I was tired. I didn't want to use drugs anymore. And I was just, my brain was scrambling trying to figure out what is it that I could do. What can I do to not use drugs? And the only thing I came up with was maybe if I go to school and and get an education that would raise my self-esteem and, and I wouldn't end up at those tracks again because I knew that if I did, maybe I wouldn't be as lucky. And I enrolled. I enrolled in Miami-Dade College, Wilson campus, uh, in the paralegal program. And I did extremely well, became an honor graduate, um, and my professors encouraged me to continue my education and so I pursued a bachelor's degree in public safety management with a concentration in criminal justice. I figured since I had a lot of experience getting arrested and appearing before judges that that would somehow or another translate into classroom success and it did, it worked. <laughs> and I ended up graduating with highest honors and eventually I was accepted in the FIU College of Law and in May of 2014, I graduated with a law degree. You can clap. I see you back there. Now, I know I'm supposed to talk about Amendment 4, right? That's what you all came here for, right? What y'all come here for? Extra credit. Who came for extra credit? Raise your hand. All right. We got some honest folks here. No, I know I'm supposed to talk about Amendment 4, but this story is about Amendment 4. This story is. It's, it's about the fact that, in spite of the fact that I've been able to turn my life around and, and, and overcome many obstacles and, 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 and go to school and eventually make, even make the dean's list in, 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 in law school, right, and, 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 and serve my community and dedicate my life to giving back. When I graduated FIU College of Law, I could not even sit for the Florida Bar to become an attorney because my rights had not been restored. Because of mistakes that I've made many years before, I was stripped of my rights and because I live in the state of Florida, I was not going to get them back. In spite of all that I've done. And I couldn't even practice in the profession that I was highly qualified to practice in. 
In spite of the fact that I've been able to accomplish so many things in life, when my wife ran for office a few years later, I couldn't even vote for her. So there was something inherently wrong with this system because in the majority of states, overwhelming majority of states, folks were able to vote after they did their time. And in two states, folks never lost the right to vote and they were able to vote even while they was in prison. Even in Puerto Rico, people were allowed to vote while they were incarcerated. And so there was something wrong and something had to be changed. And so we led an effort to amend the Constitution. We came up with the language. You know, I was, think, I was talking about this yesterday, and it dawned on me that there is a, a provision within the state constitution that was written by a formerly convicted felon. I'm like, wow. That same guy that was at the railroad tracks, right, getting ready to jump in front of a train, actually really helped craft language that, are, that is in our state constitution right now. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> and, and so, we, 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 we crafted this language and, and, and we launched this campaign and there were some things that we knew that were very important to us. Number one, we knew that we could not allow this campaign to be politicized, right? Because what we know is that when things come politicized, nothing happens. And you guys, matter of fact, we're seeing it today even with this gun stuff, right? That in spite of the fact that over 90% of folks think that there needs to be some kind of sensible gun laws or whatever, that politicians can't figure it out. Politicians can. And so we wanted to make sure that we took that debate or this subject out of the hands of politicians and we put it in the hands of the people where it should belong. Because they've had more than enough time to get it right. And they did and that's exactly what we did. So we depoliticized it. The other thing we did, and, and which was kind of, we had to walk a real fine line because this issue of felon disenfranchisement was a, was a policy that was reborn, right, out of the necessity to reduce the political power of black folks, right? No, there was no question about it that felon disenfranchisement policies in the United States was enforced or instituted or reinstituted because they wanted to keep newly released slaves from amassing political power. And so it was intended for people that look like me. But like a tumor, when left unchecked, that it could spread through the rest of the body. And this policy ended up impacting more than just black folks. It impacted Spanish folks, it impacted uh, 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 white folks, it impacted everybody. And primarily because of this country's infatuation with incarceration. And so what we found was that, that in Florida, African Americans were disproportionately impacted by felon disenfranchisement, but way more people was impacted or could not vote in Florida because of a felony conviction, and those people did not look like me. They were white. And so, how do we, we had to figure out how do we continue to embrace the original intent of felon disenfranchisement, the disproportionate impact of felon disenfranchisement, but yet be able to bring in, right, everyone under that umbrella because it did impact everyone and and we were able to successfully do that and we kept it not only above partisan politics but we also lifted up this issue above the racial anxieties and insecurities that our country experienced on a daily basis and we made it an all-american issue because at the end of the day everyone was impacted by felon disenfranchisement and when we did that, we were able to actually have conversations with people from all walks of life and all political persuasions. And in doing so, we created this umbrella to where it was an amazing, amazing grassroots effort 
that brought together all these folks and it was a machine that could not and would not be stopped. And in spite of the fact that this was such a politically charged uh, issue at a politically charged time in our country, we had no opposition. Now that's unheard of. Not one opposition. And the people who we thought were going to impose, uh, oppose it end up endorsing it. And so that is definitely um, a proud moment that, 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 that we experienced, that I personally experienced uh, in November of last year uh, when we crossed the finish line. And it's a moment in history. I think it was the, it's the greatest expansion of voting rights in the state. I know that. Um, and since the, I believe the Voting Rights Act, with 1.4 million folks who previously or were convicted of a felony offense are now able to have a pathway to vote other than having to go through the government. So very proud of that. Um, and what I want to do is talk about the implementation piece. Uh, but what I, because I have, I have the mic, right? If I could do whatever I want? Okay. So what I want to do, I want to talk about the implementation piece, but before I do that, I want to ask the audience if you all have any questions. I, yes, ma'am. I'm like getting ahead of myself, but I was very adamant. I circulated the petitions. I advocated, and now I'm looking to help with the implementation. So I guess my question is, how do we help with that piece? Is there anything that we can do? Um, you'll, I'm sure you'll get to that, but... Well, first thing was that we know that there were several people in the audience that didn't raise their hand, right, when we asked who was registered to vote. There was a table there. There was a table. Legal women voters? Could you? There you go. You know what? <laughs> the legal women voters are like baby kids, right? They just <laughs> everywhere. No matter where you turn, you're going to see somebody with legal women voters with a table and VR form, voter registration form. And so, yeah, some of the things that you could do is actually vote. Let me, let me tell y'all something. Um, I believe that, that, that we have an amazing opportunity now, right? One of the things that we said during the campaign was that we believe that every person, right, every citizen should have the right to have their voice heard, right? And, that no, and, and here's the catch. No matter how they may vote, and so... Sometimes I used to do it for shock therapy, but it was to prove a point. And it was just that we were fighting just as hard for that person that wanted to vote for Donald Trump as that person who wished they could have voted for Barack Obama. Y'all get that? Because the minute we start basing our support, right, on what we believe in and, and, and how we think people might vote, then we're not really engaging in something that exemplifies what democracy is all about. So just because I think you're going to vote the way I need you to vote, I support you getting your rights back. But if I think that you're not going to vote the way I want you to vote, then I'm against it and I'm going to come up with all type of excuses why you shouldn't vote. And that's what we have been experiencing in the past. And so we were very adamant that our fight was for everyone. Whether you look like me, whether you made the kind of money I made or more or whatever, or whether you thought different than me, it didn't matter. We wanted to vote for everyone. So a more, we believed that a more inclusive democracy was a more vibrant democracy, and a more vibrant democracy was good for everyone, right? And so we wanted to, we're in this, in this season now to where we can talk about civic engagement and we can increase voter participation. What we do know, especially here in Broward County, let me tell y'all about Broward County. How many of y'all from Broward County? Raise your hand. All right. Let me tell you. Broward County, along with other a lot of other counties, a lot of folks don't vote. Do y'all understand that? Let me let me give you some numbers. Real numbers. In 2010, there was a gubernatorial election, and Rick Scott ran against Alex Sink, right? And that election that was decided by 65, 63,000 votes. Y'all with me? 
good math people here? I need I need a real good math person. You know, a good math person? Great. 63,000 votes was the difference between the winner and the losing. That year, over 808,000 registered African Americans and 912,000 registered Latino Americans did vote. How many people is that? It's more than 68. Over 808,000 and 912,000 808,000 African Americans, 912,000 Latino Americans didn't vote. How many is that? Over 1.7 million people who were registered to vote in the state of Florida did not vote in an election that was decided by 63,000 votes. And you know, if I do my math right, that was a little bit nine years ago, that means that almost every one of you all were probably in junior high or elementary at the time, right? And when that election happened, one of the things that, that might strike, might maybe hit home with you guys, that year, that year the state of Florida, when they had all their money and they wanted to decide what to do with the money that they had, they decided that they were going to spend Five, no, my fact, was it 5000 No, it was like $3,500 to help educate each and every one of you all. So that meant that they were going to invest 3000 or give you guys a check, each of you guys a check for 3500 and say, go get your education. Y'all with me? That same year, you know what they gave me a check for? $18,000 to go sit on a bunk wearing a blue outfit and every now and then I get to walk around the grass like a blue cow grazing the field. They spent $18,000 to incarcerate each inmate but only wanted to spend $3,500 to give you an education. That's because over 1.7 million people who were registered to vote decided they had other things to do. And so teachers and professors and universities had number crutches. Broward College was not immune to that. And what we've seen that year was that, that like fire departments and police departments had to lay people off. And, 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 and so now it, it became almost like a crisis that if your house was on fire and, and somebody else's house was on fire, that the fire department had to make a decision where to go. <laughs> and chances are, if you were in the poor community, then you would probably last place. And somebody else's house was going to get attended to. And then four years later, the governor ran for re-election, and this time he ran against uh, Charlie Chris, and that election was decided by around 63,000 votes. Math man, you ready? That year, the number of African Americans who registered to vote, who didn't vote, numbered over 1.3 million. And the number of Latino Americans who registered to vote that didn't vote numbered over 1.1 million. So how much is that? So now, four years later, over now the number doubled to over 2.4 million people who did not vote, that could have voted, in an election decided by 63,000 votes. It is very apparent that if you're concerned about your future, if you're concerned about your family, if you're concerned about your community, if you're concerned about your education, if you're concerned about whatever student loan debts you might be accumulating or already have accumulated, if you're concerned about your safety, if you're concerned about your health needs, then you have to be engaged. 2.4 million people who could have had a say and how our state was ran, decided to stay home. Right now, how many of you all, right, just by a show of hands, students only, 
How many of you all would like to be able to attend classes right here without having to pay a dime? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. High. Right? Keep your hand, keep your hand up. If not only do you want, do not want to pay a dime, you actually want to get a stipend, a cost of living stipend, right? To help you take care of your phone bills and other things like that. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I want to see. All right. All right. So I'm glad you didn't raise your hand. I'm glad you didn't raise it. I'm glad you didn't. Put your hand down. Now, we get to vote on whether or not that becomes a reality. And these three people, could y'all raise your hand? Raise your hand. Raise it, raise it high. And this person raised his hand. Raise your hand high. So these are the only four people that voted. Y'all with me? <laughs> what you think is going to happen in the democratic society now? That you all got school, uh, uh, student loans to pay. You got debt to pay. And you're not getting what you really wanted. Right? And what's the reason why you're not getting what you really wanted? Because you didn't participate. And so when you stay at home or you find other things to do other than voting, you rather go to the club or rather go out and party and hang out with your friends instead of voting, you're going to have three people, right, that believe that we should not have free education. And if it's their right to believe that. And they believe that and they decide that they're going to stand up and they're going to fight for the right not to have free education. And only one person who believes that you should show, shows up and vote. And now what they believe becomes the law that we all have to live under and we cry about every single day. We have to vote. And so passing Amendment 4 means nothing. If we're not registering people to vote, if we're not now giving opportunities for returning citizens to not only register to vote, but to be engaged and have a say in how their communities and their state is ran, if we don't engage in that, if we don't be a part of, of organizations like the League of Women Voters and, 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 and the uh, uh, NAACP and, and the student groups that believe in being socially engaged, if we're not doing that, then we're not contributing to improving the lives of ourselves, our community, or our state, or our country. We have to get engaged. <clears throat> right now we have 1.4 million people who are benefit from Amendment 4. 840,000 of them do not have to worry about fines and fees, and they could be registered to vote. And then there are 560,000 that do have to pay some fine or some fee attached to their conviction that we're working on helping them also uh, remove those barriers so they can vote. But each and every one of you all can play a role in that because number one, you get yourself registered. And number two, you get with organizations that's in the room, right? And you help other people get registered to vote and you get in your community and you're asking your family members and your friends, are you registered to vote? And you get them registered to vote and then when the election time comes, guess what? You go to vote. Meek Mill coming down here next week. And y'all know about Meek Mill? Who knows Meek Mill? Yeah, I think I might go to that concert. And y'all think about going to Meek Mill concert? Where is it? Uh, Palm Beach. And y'all think about going? You think about going? You going by yourself? Ah, you're taking your girl with you. <laughs> yeah. Just y'all two, right? No other friends or nothing? Nah. Just y'all two? Yeah. Okay. He's taking his girl though, right? And that's the kind of mentality we should have. When we go vote, we shouldn't go alone. Take somebody with you. Hey, mom, come on, let's go vote. Hey, dad. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. Hey, cuz. Hey, BFF. Hey wifey, <laughs> let's go vote. Make it, make it. Uh, uh, don't let it be like a, a lone, a lone wolf type thing. Take somebody to go vote. Those are the things that we can do. That's how we make a member four successful. We make it successful by getting people registered and getting people to go out to vote. 
There's a lot of important, important issues that's going to be that you all that I know you all care about that is going that will be impacted by people who are running for office in Broward County, and it's very vitally important that you have a say. What was the most challenging thing? I think the most challenging thing that I encountered in my transformation was myself. Myself. You know, one of the hard, one of the hardest things that I found, and I'm just I'm, I'm going to try to keep it I instead of we, right? But you all can apply it how you want. One of the hardest things that I've found for me was to break old habits. Uh, the other thing was to change the way I think and view things, right? And so I was so accustomed to doing things a certain way, right? And when you asked me to change or someone asked me to change, I was totally against it. You know, remind me of a story. I remember after one of the hurricanes we had uh, years ago, I went to visit this, this guy next um, in this community. And right next door to him, this tree had, this oak tree was toppled over on his neighbor's roof. And I remember sitting you know, on the porch with this guy, and he was like, hey, you see how that big old oak tree is toppled over on the roof? But look across the street at that palm tree, right? And it's still standing there. And he asked me, well, why is that? You know, and I couldn't answer it, and then he basically told me. The oak tree was big and strong, but it was firm, it was rigid. And when the winds came, eventually what it did was it uprooted it. But the palm tree, what does it do? When the wind comes, it bends, you know. So he said, in life, you have to be the palm tree. And, and so I, I really took that to heart because everything that I've been able to accomplish, right, started with me looking internally first and seeing the role that I played that got me in the situation that I was in. And I knew that one of the things that we learned in the rooms is, is the serenity prayer, right, which is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage the change of things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? And it was being, being wise enough to understand that I can't change somebody else, right? But what I can, what I do have power over is me, and I can change me. And so that was the toughest thing that I encountered, and I, and I realized that when I was willing to change myself, and when I was willing to align myself with the universe, Align myself with nature, right? Then things were pretty cool. Now, does that mean that I didn't have tensions and conflicts? No. And no, I, that's part of life. That's part of growth. You cannot grow without experiencing the conflict or tension. It's impossible, right? And so I embraced those, but that biggest challenge was how did I change how I viewed myself and thought about myself and looked at other things. Thanks for coming here to the Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> y'all know this man here? <laughs> Go ahead. It's to have you here today, Desmond. Uh, can you give us maybe other words of wisdom for our young people and other students? Uh, I know the importance of civic engagement, but do you have words of wisdom for, for our students in terms of student success? Uh, uh, if I recall correctly, you were one of the best students that I ever met. Uh, you would study for exams like months in advance, and assignments months in advance. Any words of wisdom for our young folks how to succeed and get the most out of college? I feel sorry when they study. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what? I could give you all some great advice, right? So let me let me start by saying this. As a matter of fact, I had talked about this yesterday, right? Because I, I visited um, um, a prison. And one of my old professors was teaching a class in the prison. And she told the story about, yeah, Desmond, he used to come in and he used to sit at the front row. Any of y'all front row seaters? Boy, oh, man, that's amazing. And so he was like, yeah, Desmond sat at the front because he wanted to learn, blah, blah, blah. And what I told him was, when I got admitted, I just knew that they, Miami Dade College made a huge mistake. Right? <laughs> I mean, I was nervous as heck because 
I mean, here I was, I mean, just months removed from being homeless, uh, a, 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 a drug addict, uh, a, 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 a convicted felon. You know, I mean, I didn't have anything going for me, and I don't think that I was the type of person that should be going to college. And I just applied off of a whim. I didn't have any expectations of actually being allowed to actually go to Miami Dade College. And when they told me I could start classes, I knew that somebody up there made a mistake. Somebody was about to get fired because they let this homeless drug out again. And so and then I found out that I could actually get the uh, Pell Grant. I was like, oh, Lord, they done gone, gone and messed up. They giving me money? Oh, my God. So I knew that any minute somebody was going to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, somebody made a mistake. You got to go. And so that's why I sat at the front because I wanted to prepare myself when that opportunity come, I could show them, say, look, but I know y'all made a mistake, but look how good I'm doing. No, give me a chance, you know? And, and, and so I dove in uh, uh, to my education. I think in my entire college career, undergrad career, four years, there were only two times that I did not get a name. I think I got a B in science, because that periodic table <laughs> kicked my butt. And I got, I think, a B or a C plus in Spanish. And that was it. Because I, listen, I lived in Hialeah, so I spoke Cuban. I didn't speak Spanish, I spoke Cuban. You know, and it was a conflict between that proper Spanish and that Cuban Spanish. And, you know, I just couldn't let go of that high lyric roots I had, so I ended up getting a C on that. But that was only two times I did not get an A. What did I do? What was the secret? Prior planning prevents piss poor performance, right? And I'm going to tell you something that, you know, some of your professors are going to cringe, but they ask for it. When you, when you, when you, when you start a class, one of the first things your professor gives you is a syllabus. And on that syllabus, they have this small section in, in fine print. They, if you look at your syllabus, that print, that font is probably a little bit smaller than the rest of the syllabus. We're talking about office hours, right? <laughs> Using. That's what I did. So, for instance, if I had a paper, right, you know, they, we got this crazy paper that you have to do. <coughs> I said, okay. I get started on that paper that very same day. And I use office hours. And what that mean? That means that I do my first draft, and I take it to my professor and say, tell me what you think. What are your thoughts? And professors can't help themselves. They're going to break out that red pen, and they're going to start <laughs> destroying your paper. Right? And I love it when they destroy my paper. I wasn't disappointed. Or I wasn't upset. I loved it. I embraced it. Why do you embrace it? I embraced it because they were showing me the proper way to go. And so I would take that paper and I would go back home and I would make those changes and adjustments. And I would use office hours and say, hey, take, out. take some of your advice. Tell me what you think now. <laughs> right? And maybe they might have a little thing here and there. But by the third time, guess what? So be long before the paper is due, it's sitting in my computer and I'm going off doing other things. You know why? I know that I can't get any less than an A on that. And why? <laughs> That's how I be doing. So if you have any problem with this paper, you got a problem with, your, with yourself. Because you help me do it. So the thing about it is that professors are there not just to speak at you, right, but to work with you, to help guide you, to help you, to challenge you. To, to expand your perception and, and to expand the ways that we can solve problems and the way that we can uh, analyze things, right? And they're right there to walk with you every step of the way, right? And if you utilize them, you have no choice but to succeed. Because the greatest thing, and I'm going to speak on behalf of every professor here, the greatest thing that a professor can experience is when they see that light go on, right? That's one of the greatest things because the work that they've done, the degrees that they have, 
is not to actually make themselves look good, right? They've learned a long time ago that you get an education, because back in the days, any, no, not anybody can go to school. And it was a serious question that used to be asked at universities back in the days. Why do you want an education? See, because if you only want an education for your own self-glory or, 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 or benefit, then you're not the type of person that we want here. We want people that seek an education in order to improve the lives of others. We seek education in order so we be able to educate others, to pass it on, to keep growing. We don't want education just to hold it to ourselves and be the only people that know something. That doesn't make our world a better place. And so professors are yearning, believe it or not, for the most, they're yearning for people to knock on their door sometimes and ask them, I'm stuck on this, Professor. This is what I tried, and it doesn't seem to work. What are your thoughts? And when I learned that, that's what I engaged in, and I knew that I didn't, and never once did I have to wait for the last minute to do an assignment. When it was given, I did it right then and there, and I did it with enough time to utilize my professors if I had the need to. Right? Once, twice, three times. And when I was done, I was able to move on to other things and get ahead of my work. So I always stayed ahead. Even in law school, I was at least three weeks ahead in my readings. So there was no pressure. Thank you for that question, Mr. Wynn. <laughs> I see you getting up. I'm getting the hook now, right? But can I take just one more, one more good question? Oh. Oh, wait, 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 okay, okay, okay. So we're going to hold off on the questions because Mr. Wayne Rollins and I are going to probably be taking a lot of, so a lot of the Amendment 4 questions because I know there's a lot of things that has uh, been written in the media, op-eds and all these different pieces to talk about lawsuits and all of that, that you can ask those kind of questions for us. Um, but I think the main thing with, uh, with the implementation of Amendment 4 is that we won, we, we, we got the victory, but that victory will be hollow if we don't act upon it. And acting upon it means that we're not just looking to register returning citizens. We're looking to register every single person that's eligible to register to vote, getting them in the system, and getting them activated so our democracy can be more vibrant. Thank you so much.